All right, everybody, welcome. My name's Andrew. I am the Fort Bend County Law Librarian and the manager here at the Law Library. And we are happy to welcome you to another attorney lecture series. And as you know, this year we are focusing on attorneys, uh, whereas last year we were focusing mostly on pro se's. And so this year we're really trying to work on law practice management. We're working on practical skills that attorneys need in their practice. And today we've got Rocky Leanne Pilgrim, who's going to be talking to us about preparing for your first case. And she is an attorney with more than 17 years experience. And she practices here in Fort Bend and the surrounding areas in family law and does business consulting and law practice management, which is what she's going to be talking about today. So without further ado, Rocky, take it away. Great, right. thank you so much, Andrew. And I just wanna say that it is my privilege to be able to present today. And I just wanna thank Andrew, Jonathan, the Fort Bend County Law Library for the opportunity to speak um, and to offer today's presentation, which is presenting your first case. Um, because this is potentially like a super broad topic and it's definitely a very broad uh, title, which is open to some interpretation, I'm planning to give kind of an overview of general thoughts and ideas that every attorney needs to be aware of. I am a family law practitioner primarily. Um, that's what the bulk of my 17 years of experience has been in. But the things that I'm talking about today really do go to law practice management and matter management. And so I wanna make sure that we have um, some of the, the major topics covered. This is early in the series. And so if there's any topic that you guys would like more details about or more information about, please feel free to reach out to me or to the Fort Bend County Law Library for future topics. So, as I mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about the two broad areas because really preparing for your first case, first law practice management, getting your law office actually running, it's case management and, and client control. And then it could also potentially be like getting ready for litigation. But because that's so fact specific and subject matter specific, um, I'm kind of leaving the actual litigation portion of it for another presentation. And we're going to be focusing here today on law practice management and case management. Now, some of the very broad things that you should be thinking about when you're setting up your office and when you're setting up, okay, when this first client or when a client walks in the door, what do I need to be ready for? Are like basic things, right? What address are you gonna use? All of us sign up with the state bar and we have to have our official location. What number are they gonna call? What email address are they gonna use? Do I have a website? Um, there are things like banking and finance management that you have to think of, marketing, compliance issues. And these are all things that I'm gonna, going to address here in just a little bit more detail. So starting from the basics, mailing address, versus your physical address. So as a solo practitioner, some of the um, things that you need to think about, and it's a little bit different if you're working for a firm, um, so this won't be as, as applicable, but your mailing address and your phys physical address don't necessarily have to be the same, but remember everything that you're portraying to your clients goes to your professionalism and the confidence that they're going to be having in you as their representative. So, COVID kind of shoved us all into a technological era. A lot of us have been working from home. A lot of us have had to make adjustments as to where we're going to be physically and how we're meeting with clients. And so you don't necessarily have to take on the expense of paying for a separate office in a building or subleasing from somebody. But you do wanna make sure that you're taking your privacy into consideration and that you're taking safety into consideration. So depending on your practice area, um, we are dealing with lay people. Um, as a family attorney, sometimes we have opposing parties that can get kind of grumpy. Sometimes we have clients who get a little emotionally escalated. This can happen in all areas. And so you really don't wanna use your home address for things. Um, you wanna maintain your privacy and your work and personal boundaries as clear as possible. So if you are working from home, if you don't have a physical location, 
there are mailing addresses that will still give you a physical address. You may want to consider an office share situation or a sublease situation. There are a lot of professional suites that will have a receptionist for you and will accept your mail. And all of those things present very professionally. Keep your overhead low, but still maintain your privacy um, at the same time. The next thing is your phone system. So if you're not working from a physical location and you have a physical landline, we have all sorts of options. You have your traditional phone systems, voice over internet protocol systems. Those are things like Vonage or other internet based phone lines. If you have a Google number, those are free, um, but they come with some weirdness. So keep that in mind. And then obviously everybody's got a cell phone nowadays but you don't necessarily want your cell phone to be public, again, because you wanna be able to have some separation between your personal life and your business life. And so if your cell phone is constantly ringing, you wanna be able to have the difference between your personal calls and business calls, fresh intake calls. You wanna be able to keep track of those so that you're not feeling like you're always at work or that you don't have any downtime. And again, it can become a safety issue and a privacy issue at the same time. Email, we all need to have email addresses. We all, I am suggesting, should have a website. Um, guys, we are in the year 2021. Everybody has been thrown very hard into the technological era. Please stop using AOL email addresses. Please stop using Yahoo email addresses for your business email accounts. Vanity accounts, vanity earls are so inexpensive. You can have a placeholder website that allows you to have personalized email addresses. Everything that you do, everything that you communicate from your email address to the website that you have up, the first thing anybody does when they hear your name is they're gonna Google you. They're gonna wanna know what you do, how you do it, what you look like. They're gonna try to find you on Facebook to see what your Facebook posts look like. And it just adds that level of professionalism. We are a service industry. And so it is really essential that we provide our clients with confidence that we are professionals, that we consider ourselves professionals, and that we've taken those extra steps to present professionally, because that's how we're going to be representing them, whether it's transactionally or ultimately in court, they wanna know what the face of their representatives are going to look like and this is gonna be their first taste of that. So just say no to your personal. This also provides you with the ability to keep your personal items and your business items separate, which is really gonna be important. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more, but when it comes down to tax issues and things like that, this is not just a work-life balance situation, but it, it goes to your accounting issues and things like that. As you're getting started, staffing considerations are something else that you want to take in mind. To hire or not to hire, do you want that overhead? Do you have the ability to train somebody? Do you need somebody? So this presentation is geared primarily towards solo practitioners um, or people who are going into a smaller practice, but this also can apply to larger firms when you're considering who it is that's going to be the face of your business. Answering services are sometimes a really good stopgap because as entrepreneurs, which is what attorneys are when we have our own businesses and we're not working for somebody, you wear all the hats. And as you get started, you wanna make sure that you have your processes in place, that you have thought about the different hats that you wear, so that you can allocate your time and your energy. And answering all of the calls is not an efficient use of your time as an attorney. So if you're not ready to hire front desk staff, if you're not ready to hire a receptionist or a clerk or a legal assistant, then an answering service could be a potential alternate option. You just wanna make sure that you're using the right one. So services like Ruby receptionist, um, things like that, where they have worked with attorney's offices before, they understand that this can be a very um, difficult time for people, that they are seeking professional services. You wanna make sure that whoever is the 
person answering your phone is the faith. They are the face of your business. They are the first taste that your clients are going to get for the kind of services that you provide. And so you want to make sure that the person is reflecting the culture of your office, that they are representing the energy that you're going to be bringing to your cases. And that that's the person that you want to be the face for everything that everybody's getting on their first impression. In terms of marketing, I'm just going to touch on this real quick. I know that the last uh, series that we had touched on this quite a bit, but when you are considering marketing, just keep in mind that you don't just want to say, I'm a lawyer, call me. You want to have your ideal client in mind. So who is it that you want to serve? Who is it that you are targeting that you want to help, that you want to see come in your door? And that doesn't mean just subject matter, but it also means Things like, do you want to represent businesses? Do you want to represent individuals? Do you only want to handle estates that are going to be in, you know, six figures? So keep in mind who it is that you want to have as your clients so that you are targeting those clients. Nowadays, we have almost infinite options in terms of marketing strategy and, um, and really just, just the options that you have from social media to actual targeted marketing to Google My Business. Keep in mind, however, that we have rules regarding attorney advertisements. Very recently, in fact, I think last week, there were some new rules that were proposed, new advertising rules. We now, at least soon, will be able to have trade names. So make sure that anything that you post, anything that you publish, anything that you talk about, is going to be in compliance with the state bar rules and regulations. So those are very specific. You can look those up. This is one of those areas where we could have a whole lecture series just on compliance issues with the state bar. I just wanna make sure that that's brought to your attention. Um, there are other compliance concerns that you want to make sure that you're aware of. When you are bringing in cases, there is the number one way to get yourself in trouble with the state bar is to commingle client funds and your funds. So if you, when you are doing your fee agreements, when you are establishing the fee deposits that are going to be made, be very careful of the terminology that you use. And remember, at minimum, when you open up your practice, at minimum, you have two bank accounts. You have your trust account and you have your operating account. I am going to just toss out there that in terms of law practice management, I would suggest that you have at least one or two other accounts, which include a tax account and probably a payroll account if you guys are hiring somebody or if you're paying yourself out of your business. Um, but at minimum, you have two accounts, which include your trust account and your operating account. The quickest way to get in trouble, like I said, is to not keep those accounts straight and to not keep your accounting straight. So make sure that you are in compliance with that. Um, HIPAA and H or House Bill 300 protocols. Um, there is a fantastic training that um, is offered through the state bar and that are periodically offered through um, the Fort Bend County CLE series, whether it's through the Fort Bend County Law Library. Um, the Family Bar of Fort Bend periodically hosts these uh, the protocols every year we are required as um, as covered entities, which is how it's phrased in the statute, to go through HIPAA and House Bill 300 compliance training. So as an attorney, we get all sorts of sensitive information, social security numbers, banking information, um, healthcare information, and we are subject to the protocols under HIPAA and the more stringent House Bill 300 protocols. So make sure that anytime you're transmitting information, that your emails are secure, that they are encrypted, that if you are storing digital information, that it's encrypted and that it is password protected. Um, hopefully you have some kind of HIPAA compliant document control. We're gonna talk about options for that in just a minute. But the penalties for failing to um, adhere to these protocols are pretty significant and they are per violation. Um, and so make sure that if you have not had that training, 
that you are getting that training every year. It's not just for you, it's for every staff member that is in your office as well. Um, we have, if you do have staff members and they are W2 employees, just make sure guys that you are following. We are employers, so don't get sideways on your taxes. Don't get sideways on your reports. Make sure that you are in compliance with all of the things that come with being an employer. Um, and then in terms of insurance, just make sure that you have whatever insurance you feel is necessary. There is some debate as to whether or not malpractice insurance is something that everybody should carry. Um, and everybody kind of thinks that insurance is meant to protect the insured, right? We get insurance to cover ourselves, and that's true. But as solo practitioners, as smaller offices, um, really the insurance is to help protect the client. That is the purpose of having insurance. So if something happens, and y'all, mistakes happen. We're human. They call it practicing law for a reason, just like practicing medicine. None of us are going to be perfect. So if something happens and an error is made, the insurance is meant to help protect the client and help make them whole. So often we're not going to have the financial resources to be able to help a client who's been damaged by something that may happen. And so that's what the insurance is for. So there's malpractice insurance, but if you have a storefront, if you've hung out your shingle, you also need things like premises liability insurance. You wanna make sure that you have um, errors and omissions policies. I'll tell you that you wanna make sure you have insurance in case there is some kind of a hack that's done. Somebody does a data breach. I had a good friend of mine who had um, his, ransomware installed and so all of his information was taken and fortunately he had insurance that covered the cost of recovering that information and the damage that was done so when you think about insurance don't just think about malpractice insurance that's important and um, the state bar offers insurance it's kind of a co-op so there are some benefits if you want to participate in that but there are tons of insurance policies just do your due diligence as to the one that will meet your needs the most. Um, but don't just think about malpractice insurance. Think about all of the other things that will also come with covering the other things that can happen. We have had kind of an unprecedented series of weather events. Um, it started with Harvey, where we had law offices that lost files, that lost equipment that had to be renovated. And so those are the kinds of insurances that even if it's not your home insurance, that you want to make sure that you're covered for, and even if it's not your building that you are covered for in terms of your professional items and um, your professional liabilities that come with owning a business in general. Now, in terms of client and case management, so that was kind of a super fast, super quick overview of like the pragmatics of just running an office, right? So now we're going to talk a little bit about, okay, we have a human that's come in the door. What am I going to do with them? And so initial client contact. You want before that client comes in or before your next client comes in to have a plan for what you're going to say and how you're going to handle them. And there are all sorts of different considerations. We have all sorts of obligations, uh, fiduciary duties and things like that that attach as soon as we learn somebody's name. And so you want to make sure that you have your initial intake protocols in place. Again, this is why your front desk person or your receptionist or the person who's answering your phone is so essential, not just because of the first impressions, but because they're the ones who are going to be getting this initial set of information. So at my office, I have established, um, I'm a big form person. I like for things to be predictable. I like to know where I'm going to find information. And so we have developed what I like to call my intake dispo form. Um, this used to be two different forms. Um, this, your stuff does not need to look like mine now, but I have this form printed in duplicate and it's at every telephone that we've got in the office. Anytime somebody has the potential to answer a call, they're going to have this form in front of them because it's going to get all of the basic information that I want to have about somebody the moment that they call in. I'm going to need to know their name. I want to kind of know their geographic area because, for example, I, I was getting calls from Collin County. Um, I practice primarily in Fort Bend, 
Collin County's really, I'll go up there if the money is right, but I probably am going to refer them out to somebody else, right? So we need to know the basics. And in order to properly do conflict checks, we kind of need to know who else is involved, right? Um, but the first thing you want to know is why are they calling? But you don't want their whole life story. You don't want your receptionist to be the person who is determining what kind of case it is, whether or not it's they're not fully vetting the case at this stage. They're just getting the basic information and setting your appointment. This is also about efficiency. So this gets all of the basic information that you need and helps you get the information for later case management controls. Um, I like this form as well because it lets me know how we finished the case out. So I know that once this form is completely completed, then the case is done, all the boxes are checked, and I don't have to worry about lingering issues that may, may pop up. So once we have that, initial client interview considerations. So these are things like, why are we gonna do initial consultations for free? That's a question that comes up a lot. Um, should I give them that free hour consultation? Should I charge for that consultation? What am I going to cover in the consultation? And the reason that you need to establish what you're going to be doing during that initial consultation is because there are people who are just fishing for information. They're not intending to hire you. They just want to kind of get their free bits where they can, which is fine, except they're wasting your time. As attorneys, the only thing that we have to offer is our time. So we are offering a service. We don't have a product that's on in stock on a shelf. We have only our time. And so if we fill up our time with a bunch of people who have no intention of furthering their relationship with us or furthering their business relationship, um, then we kind of need to be pragmatic about what that looks like. And so my suggestion is to always charge. Um, you don't have to charge your full rate. But that lets them know that this is a service that you're providing, that it needs to be taken seriously, and that they need to have some skin in the game. Um, you need to establish how long this initial interview is going to be, because is it going to be an hour? Is it going to be 30 minutes? Um, what information are you trying to glean from this initial interview? Because this is where you're first establishing your boundaries. Part of the other thing that you're doing is making sure that you're able to do your matter management stuff. So conflict checks. This is like one of the other areas that's super important because we have fiduciary duties. If somebody comes in and tells you their life story, whether or not they hire you, you are now conflicted out of representing any adverse party to that litigation. So if you have someone who, when they first call your office, starts to tell you everything about what's been going on and all of the problems that they have. Now, suddenly you're, you've been taken out of the arena of possible. Good engagements where if somebody else calls or something like that. You, you just, you can't even consider taking them on as clients. So. Conflict checks are a huge deal matter management programs. So now there are a slew of different options. And in the past, people used to keep track of things like in Excel programs or by just trying to remember um, having notes written down somewhere. We are again in 2021. There are a host of matter management programs, many of which are cloud based. Um, things like Clio, uh, Rocket Matter. Things like that. There are some through other programs that also work with uh, form builder programs. The reason that these are so important are not just for your conflict checks, but for um, other protocols as well. Let me talk about conflict checks for just a second. This form, this is where your protocols are going to be super important, guys. And this is just an example of a form that I have in my office so that everybody understands why conflict checks are important what it looks like to run a conflict check and where you have to look. So I use Clio and I use Dropbox. Um, Clio is fairly new. I've been in practice for a long time. I didn't have Clio when I started. And so all of my files are in those two places, which is why it's referenced here. But you wanna make sure that everybody understands why it's important, what the potential ramifications are, 
and have have your procedures in place so that there's no ambiguity. Um, as lawyers, we tell our clients all the time, eliminate ambiguity. Then everybody knows what's happening. It's predictable. We can control it. It's the same thing with your office. And so with matter management programs, you're inputting all of that information. Conflict checks are super easy. It's one of the reasons why they're so important. You have centralized information for everybody. So you're not asking where is the email address for the client? What's been happening on the case? But what's their email address? You know, what is the last thing that's happened? You have a running docket sheet. If you're utilizing the programs to their fullest extent, it will keep everything together, including your emails, including the documents that you're sharing with the clients. You have it all centralized. And this isn't just to make your life easier and to help you run your practice more efficiently, but it's also to cover your ass. So we have clients, they're in conflict, they have different issues. Like I said, things happen. And if you keep up with your procedures, if everybody's following protocol and you're able to find it, then when that complaint comes in, when somebody files that grievance, when somebody's saying, I called your office five times and nobody has responded, you have one centralized location where you can say, actually, you called once. We tried to call you back. We left you three messages. Um, and then you called back at two o'clock in the morning and nobody is at the office at that time. So you have the ability to keep control over knowledge and what's been happening in the cases so that um, those kinds of issues become less important. Now, calendar control and Outlook. Um, I use Outlook for all of my programs, y'all, Microsoft 365. There are different document management programs. There are different um, document assembly programs. I will say that Outlook is probably going to be the most comprehensive way for you to control the hundreds of emails that you're going to be getting in a day. And I cannot tell you in my office, calendar control and docketing is among the highest of priorities, if not the highest priority. The last thing that you want is that call from a court saying, we are getting started with your hearing. Where are you? And you have no idea what they're talking about. There's just no reason for that to happen. It is one of the issues that can come up with, especially in our very mobile society and in a world where people are working remotely, or if you give up your calendaring to somebody else, like an assistant or something like that to control, you want to make sure that everybody knows what's happening, everything that's scheduled, that it is scheduled immediately. And when you have things like Outlook, it syncs across all of your devices and it syncs in real time. So Microsoft 365, this is something that again ties into your website. Um, it all kind of works together to make sure that everything is syncing across. There is no reason why you can't input something into your calendar at any point or any place that you're at. You can do it on your phone, you can do it from your laptop, your assistant can do it, and then it immediately should sync across all of your devices as long as they're powered up and on the internet. Um, because this is a priority issue. Like, I, I just can't stress it enough. Um, document control. When I'm talking about documents, I'm talking about electronic documents and I'm talking about your physical case file. So, again, this goes all the way back to the things that I mentioned earlier things like um, privacy controls, HIPAA compliance, things like that. There are so many cloud based options at this point, things like Dropbox. Um, there are other medic. They're they're geared more towards the medical industry, um, but they're meant to be kind of at a higher encryption level. Uh, there's an organization called Trezor It T R E S O R I T um, that is end to end encrypted, where you can share documents. But you want to make sure that your electronic file is mirroring your paper file if you have one. Get a good scanner, guys. That needs to be part of your desk staple, um, not just your electronics and your phone, but a good scanner. Um, because if a client comes in and just dumps a bunch of stuff on you or on your assistant, how are you going to manage that? You're not going to put it in a box in the corner. 
you need to go through it, make sure that it's been scanned, make sure that you have it indexed and documented so that you know what you've got. And so that you have your protocols in place so that if you need to find something, you can find it immediately. Um, there are certain naming protocols. This would get us a little bit into the weeds on what it really means to kind of do full document control. I've got a whole protocol and series of things that I do when I'm conferring with uh, lawyers and with law offices about how to control discovery, how to control the influx of random paperwork that clients bring in. Um, just keep in mind, you want to make sure that wherever you are storing your information, whether it's cloud-based, whether you have an IT person who is hosting a local server for you, you want to make sure that it's going to be secure. You want to make sure that you don't have a situation where ransomware can become an issue. So um, hard-based servers are becoming a little bit less popular. Um, for a while, they were like all the rage, right? But that is not typically what we do nowadays. We typically are going to be cloud based, but that cloud pushes out to your devices. You still have a physical hard drive backup. So always have everything backed up, maybe have redundant backups um, and get a good IT person. That should be somebody who's just on call for you. If you don't have those relationships, get those relationships established, just like you would with your banker or with your CPA. Okay, so document control. Those are all of kind of the logistics that go into, all right, so we've got a person that's coming in, we've got forms, we've got the information that's coming in. What am I gonna do in this initial interview? What am I actually going to tell people? And so this is where we've got your client and your case management itself. In your initial client interview. So they've called, you've gotten the basics, You've got them scheduled. They're coming in for their initial client interview. You're going to give them the hour, whether you're billing them or not. What is this interview for? Information gathering. First and foremost, you're gathering information about them. They're gathering information about you. Remember, this is a service based industry that we're in. Um, everything that we're doing is so that we can further the client's interest. We just happen to are we happen to be doing it at a bit higher stakes, but we are in a service industry. And so you want to make sure that you're getting enough information that you have a decent grasp of what's going on. But this is not the time that you want to get into the full details of their case that happens after they hire you. Remember, this is a situation where you want to find out whether or not they're a good fit for your office and whether you're a good fit for them. One of the things that I explain to clients when they come into my office is it's just like in any other industry, I'm not going to take it personally if I'm not the right fit. They shouldn't take it personally if they're not the right fit for my office. If it doesn't work well, then it just sets everybody up for failure. And our profession, honestly, is difficult enough. We don't need to make it harder working with somebody that we just don't work well with. Have your forms set. So before your clients come in, you should have basic intake forms. And you want to let your clients fill out these forms. So, or the PNCs, potential new clients. Um, because this is information gathering, let them be the ones who provide this information. And you want to have a packet ready for them so that they can take it and then bring it back. Sometimes attorneys want to give them these forms ahead of time. Um, it just depends on how detailed you want to get and what their issues really are that they are going to be discussing. But at minimum, you should have intake forms that cover the basics for the type of case that, that they are bringing to your office. Um, the state bar has model forms and model intake forms that you can use. I, of course, have over the years tweaked these forms to meet kind of the information that I've learned is most important. But this is also them giving you their perspective. Um, keep in mind, as you are talking to your potential clients, that they're not necessarily going to have done this before. They don't know what kind of information is important or not important. And so good interviewing skills are really key at this time. You want to be able to pull out the essential information to keep them on task and to really focus in on 
what you know the issues are going to be the most important issues um, for the type of case that they are presenting. Have your fee agreements already pre-made. So when a client comes in, you should already have your fee agreements. Y'all, this goes back to what I was talking about with your operating and your trust account. The agreements are critical, and I know that there is no technical requirement that we have written fee agreements, but again, we want to eliminate ambiguity. Everybody needs to know what the ground rules are and what the terms of your engagement are going to be. Who, what, how, when, and to what extent. So, who's your client? Make sure that that's clear. Is it a business? Is it the individual? If two people come in, what kind of confidentiality issues are there going to be? I don't let people come in and start giving me a bunch of confidential information if they've brought their um, boyfriend or their parent or somebody like that. Because anything that we talk about, even if they haven't hired me yet, is still confidential. And we need to help instill in the client the understanding of how important that confidential relationship really is. The agreements, let everybody know what you're billing how you're billing, are you gonna charge for emails? Are you charging for text messages if texting is an option for your clients? Are you gonna be billing extra if they decide that they have to talk to you over the weekend? All of these things need to be spelled out. Um, money issues and communication issues are the number one complaints with the state bar. And making sure that everybody understands what the ground rules are, are the best ways of making sure that those misunderstandings don't happen. So always have written fee agreements. Don't try to come up with it after they're there. Just have the blanks ready to fill in. Um, and you can modify. If you're gonna give somebody a break on your rate, if you're gonna give them a break on your initial fee deposit, things like that, you can always modify those, but at least have the framework ready and in place. Guys, you are not hired until that fee agreement is signed and you have gotten paid. Make sure that you have the money in hand. Um, Inevitably, there is a progression that happens and you are wonderful and you are a savior and you have saved them until the case is over and they owe you $10,000 and suddenly it really didn't take that much work. And why is your bill so high? You can avoid these kinds of conflicts by making sure that everybody knows you are not hired until that fee agreement is signed, the deposit is made, and then what the rules are for you um, continuing to represent them through the litigation, that's the kind of case it is. This initial client interview is about whether this is a good fit. And part of that is establishing expectations and boundaries. The biggest issue that we find with clients is that, especially in a small town and Fort Bend, you know, we have big city, we have big cities, but we are still um, very close to our community. I think that's one of the reasons I enjoy practicing in Fort Bend. And sometimes those client expectations and boundaries get a little bit blurred. You wanna make sure that everybody understands what the rules are, how their case is gonna progress, and that they are good with that and that they're gonna maintain those boundaries. That's what that initial client meeting and interview is for. Once that's done and you are hired, case management is the next most important thing. What are you going to be looking at? Now, we've talked a little bit already about what it looks like to get the physical part ready, right? Like, what does it look like for the client to come in? How are we going to set everything up? An actual case management, now you have somebody who's told you about their matter. You've been hired to help them solve a problem. How are we going to solve that problem? First things you need to start looking at, statutes of limitation. This is a number one issue. A lot of times people are not um, aware that there may be statutes of limitation in their cases. And so you need to make sure that if that's done, again, remember, calendar is your number one priority. This is one of the things that should be calendared immediately. Find out if you have an enforcement action in a family law case. There are a lot of individuals who don't realize that there is a statute of limitation on enforcing a property division. It's two year statute of limitation. So if they come to you saying, man, he never paid me the $15,000 that he owed me under the decree, children's issues kind of survive. And so everybody kind of thinks of family issues that way, not property. So make sure that you have fully explored timelines, dates, 
and that you get all of those calendars and that you have your tickle reminders to make sure that you don't bump those deadlines. Make sure that you have a firm understanding of any of your standing orders and local rules. Where is this case located? Where are the parties located? What are the rules and procedures that are established in your county and in the specific court? So it may be that if this is new litigation, you don't have a court um, assigned yet. But if so, make sure that you have all of those local rules. I have a separate folder that I put in every case where it goes just towards those local rules. And as we have elections and as new judges come in, new protocols get put in place. I know in Harris County, there was a little bit of um, some growing pains, let's say, and there were new local rules. It seemed like every week for the first six months. And so just make sure that you're always keeping up with those. The, the courts have been really good at updating their websites. Um, oddly enough, Facebook has been one of the primary places for new information. So if you are a zero social media kind of person, you may wanna consider going ahead and establishing an account just so that you can stalk some of the local bars uh, and um, courts because that's where a lot of the judges are posting information now. When you do have to file things, how do you know what your pleadings are supposed to look like? So this is where things like form builders and model forms come into play. The state bar is great with their different sections at promulgating model um, forms. Um, they are not perfect, however, so be careful. They try to do the best they can. They have committees that work very hard for free to make sure that we have the best information that we can get, but they are still not gonna be perfect and they still have to be tailored to your case. So when you're deciding what to, what to use, we have different form builder programs that are for purchase. There are books that we have um, there are the state bar forms, but think about what you're going to be using before that client walks in the door, because there is enough of a learning curve when you are dealing with the new facts that are in front of you. You don't want to be hunting basic forms at the same time that you're trying to help this individual. Um, guys, new discovery rules. So this is a hot topic. Um, I don't know when you're watching this video, if you guys are watching the video later, this is early in 2021, and our Supreme Court has just put out new discovery rules. So our mandatory disclosures, um, which used to be not mandatory, but just rule 194 disclosures, guys, these are mandatory now. This is why it is so important that you attend CLEs, that you keep up with the rules, because now in every single case, except for, I think, 4D cases, child support cases, Within 30 days of someone filing an answer, there is a laundry list of information that is required to be exchanged. So make sure that you're keeping up with all of the new rules. Make sure that you're keeping up with your continuing education credits because you'll be able to um, not get sideways on something that you didn't realize was brought down and now suddenly we have all of these other obligations. This is something else, again, that needs to be popped in your calendar. And then finally, this is just where your checklists and written protocols come in. As you get different people that work for you, as you get different things that come in your office, as your caseload starts to grow, you really wanna make sure that you have your procedures written down and outlined because we get busy, things happen. Um, I always have a checklist for when I'm proving up a case because inevitably I'm gonna to forget to ask somebody whether or not they've lived in the county for the last six months. So we wanna make sure that you have those protocols in place. It provides predictability, it provides accountability, and it just helps you really think about the different things that you have to cover and, and just keep from falling through the cracks once you start getting busier and busier. So these have been kind of a very quick down and dirty sort of what do I need to think about? What do I need to do before that first case walks in? And once they do walk in the door, um, these are the most important things that I could think of as new cases come in. I want to thank everybody for this opportunity to kind of give you this very quick overview of what happens when you're getting ready for your first case. I'm not sure how many people we have actually participating live, 
but I did want to leave some extra time for any questions if there were any questions that anybody has um, at this point. So again, thank you so much. And Andrew or any of the folks that are listening, if you've got any questions, please let me know. What's your view on kind of like a professional organization starting off, you know, I guess at the top, like the ABA, you know, all the way down to your local bar associations? Absolutely. So one of the things that's super important and one of the ways this is participating in local bar associations, participate, participating in professional organizations has a multitude of benefits. Um, first, it's marketing and networking. So your network is your net worth and nobody's going to hire you if they don't know that you exist. And so getting your name out there, knowing people, Having people that you can talk to when you have questions, when some weird thing comes up, that's really a key um, aspect of participating in these professional organizations. I would say that other than the state bar and the local sections or whatever your practice area happens to be, that your local community professional organizations and bar associations are going to be the most important for you. And the reason I say that is because they're the ones who are going to have their finger on the pulse of the legal community in your area. They're the ones who are going to be able to provide the most up to date information. When we're wondering during the freeze, whether or not the courts are going to be open or we're having hearings, it's the information from our local leadership, our local bar associations who help to provide that information. When we have the new discovery rules that come out. Or a new local rule from a court. It's going to be from those professional organizations. Also, they do tend to provide not just continuing education opportunities, but they usually have things like um, their own model forms or form depositories, for lack of a better word, where people are trying to share best practices and information sharing. So we're all kind of in this together and being able to talk to and interact with your colleagues um, helps you to grow as an individual and as a professional, and it helps to provide a lot of those resources. Excellent. Thank you. Absolutely. Anything else? Any other questions? I know you've got I'm questions. Better, Andrew. I know you want to say something. <laughs> yes. Well, I like to hear myself talk. So, uh, going on the same vein, uh, uh, the law library is also very important. Uh, when yes. you're starting out because of all the great resources we have. So did you use the law library when you were first starting out and, and was it important to you? You know, and I did not mean to be remiss in that. And for everybody's sake, Andrew has not put me up to this. I will tell you that of all of the different law libraries that I have utilized, and yes, your local law library um, will have a wealth of resources available to you. But I will tell you that the Fort Bend County Law Library has made not just written resources, but electronic resources, um, educational materials like the one that you're watching right now, um, archives of materials. They are incredibly proactive at providing um, information, not just to attorneys, but to the public in general. And you should always, always seek out information with your local law library, whether it's our fantastic Fort Bend County Law Library or wherever you happen to be, um, because they really do have a wealth of information. All of the forms that you could buy for your law office, they will more likely than not have available in some form or fashion at the library itself. I have utilized um, law libraries. The era of COVID has changed things just a little bit, but I have often gone to the law library just to have a space to work, to feel the energy, um, to just be able to kind of bounce ideas off of the people that are there, not just, you know, the librarians, but other colleagues that happen to be around. Um, and then you just find sometimes just random things that are oddly helpful. So absolutely, I've always used, utilized the law libraries, um, whether in person, electronically now, and they're an absolute um, fundamental resource. And, you know, Texas is actually fairly unique in terms of county law libraries. You know, there's a lot of states around the country that do not utilize local law libraries. And so we're pretty lucky here in Texas uh, to have that. So 
Um, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, and actually recently it was, I guess it was a couple of years ago now, the uh, Texas legislature passed the um, update to the law library statute that now allows multiple counties to go together uh, if they can't afford one on their own uh, to create a law library. So uh, That's hopefully, amazing. hopefully counties will take advantage of that and uh, we'll have some more local law libraries. So if you happen to practice uh, somewhere else in the state and you've never practiced there before, um, hopefully we'll have a law library available sooner than later. So uh, uh, good thing. That is awesome. Yeah, I had no idea um, about Texas being unique and I think it is fantastic that because, you know, a lot of the small, smaller, more rural counties, the ones that still have judges that ride the circuit, you know, um, you're right. A lot of their resources are are not as um, plentiful as we have uh, been able to take advantage of here in Fort Bend and surrounding areas. So that's great to know. I got a question here from uh, Lisa Gonzalez, who evidently doesn't have her microphone on. But her question, <laughs> her question to you is, when you started your law practice, did you go from law school to solo or did you work for someone else? So I... I think I did it kind of backwards. I worked for a large firm when I was in law school um, and I kind of got the big firm feel, but I have always kind of been a small town girl. And so when I graduated from law school and passed the bar, I just went out on my own immediately. Um, so a lot of the information that I'm giving you has been hard earned, um, learned through experience and trial and error. And um, I have had the benefit of having lots of friends and mentors who have been in larger firms. Um, as I've gotten older, I've utilized those a little bit more. Like I said, I did this a little bit backward, um, but uh, I did go out on my own immediately. And so trying to work through this myself has really helped me to come up with a lot of these processes and procedures. And there really is, you know, just to speak to that, like, Getting the experience of a large firm is beneficial, but it also doesn't give you the, it doesn't necessarily give you the foundational parts because those have been assigned to other people. So if you're in like a huge firm where you've got a ton of paralegals and then a file clerk and then a receptionist and a bunch of people who are wearing those other hats, it's really hard to know whether or not they're doing what they're supposed to be doing the way that they're supposed to be doing it because you haven't been in their shoes. And so I don't know if it's just like my personal preference or the way that I've done things. I kind of like to know how things work, um, partially because I'm a nerd and I'm curious, but also I feel like I can help guide other people a little bit more effectively if I've been in their shoes. It's really hard for me to tell somebody how to do their job if I haven't done it myself. You know, it, it's just that lack of perspective. And then also having a good rapport, um, I think has, it's been a good thing to be able to wear those hats myself because then I'm not necessarily as hard on somebody or I may be harder on somebody because I have done it. So being able to to have that perspective, I think is important. That's a good point. You know, it's a, sometimes if you work in a, you know, a small firm or a solo firm, as opposed to kind of a big firm, a big firm, you're sometimes kind of insulated from some of the nuts and bolts of what, you know, really goes on. Uh, you know, because you're really just kind of expected to work on your cases and going forward, and there's a, a large support staff that handles all those mm -hmm. little intricacies that, you know, when you're, when you're a solo or a small firm, it's kind of all on you, you know, it's uh, the copier is broken, you're the one calling the copier <laughs> guy or whatever, you know. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Or being the copier guy. <laughs> yeah. Excellent point. Yeah. Well, and I think that a lot of, um, a lot of the struggles that I've seen in some of my consulting clients when they're trying to transition from working for somebody to having their own office is, are those growing pains of not realizing all of the things that come with running an office. Um, it's kind of like explaining to your family what you do. And because they're not living in your world, they're just like, oh, you just, you're a lawyer. You've got lots of money and it just came with your degree, you know, and they don't kind of understand the background. Um, that's why I am a firm believer in delegation, things like your bookkeeping, having a good CPA, having a good IT person, because as an entrepreneur, like I mentioned earlier, we wear all the hats. 
and we need to be able to wear all the hats, but we need to realize that the first and foremost role that we play is as attorney and providing that service to the client because we have our license on the line. And so you wanna have those processes in place so that they can kind of run and be taken care of and you don't have to use your mental energy on the day to day, like you have to run your operations but we're also attorneys and so trying to balance all of those different roles and not realizing what all of those roles really entail when you're going from working for somebody to then trying to hang your own shingle um, has caused a lot of growing pains and so that's one of the things that i've noticed because there is that insulation like you mentioned and i think another thing you know and this goes with any profession but don't be afraid to ask for help you know, don't be afraid to attend CLEs or a program like this at the law library uh, or ask a colleague from law school or, or, you know, someone in the bar association that you never even have talked to before, but maybe they practice in your area of law because, uh, you know, trying to figure it out on your own um, isn't always the most productive. And so Absolutely. I, think, I think being able to ask for help um, is is a huge step down the road. Yes, absolutely. And that goes towards those professional associations and organizations, because that's where you meet the people that you feel comfortable reaching out to. And that's where you learn about programs like this. And, you know, you want to be respectful of people's time and you want to make sure that, you know, you're maintaining your professionalism. But we've all been there. We all started from the beginning. Um, we all make mistakes. We all are trying to figure it out. And there isn't a time and there isn't a person that I don't also learn from, even when I'm providing mentorship or I'm providing guidance at the same time, I'm also learning and I'm also benefiting from that. And so don't think that you're taking advantage or don't be embarrassed or don't think this is a dumb question. Um, you will find the right people and we are all in this together and we all build and grow and help our communities and our clients the best when we help support each other. And I will say here at the law library, we do have a lawyering skills collection um, that I've been working on contributing to adding to over the years um, that that delves into these topics uh, uh, more in depth. And, uh, you know, you'd be amazed how many topics uh, or how many books on this very topic come out of the American Bar Association, uh, the state bar, you name it. Um, mm -hmm that that are very informative and so if you're ever curious please come drop by um starting monday by the way if you haven't heard we are reopening on monday um our hours will remain the same we'll still be eight to five monday through friday um you do need to follow you know all the social distancing guidelines wear a mask inside the courthouse so um but feel free to come on down so is there any more questions? Um, well, Rocky, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I appreciate it. You did a fantastic job. And uh, I would imagine we'll be asking you back sometime fairly soon. So, uh, uh, you know, you've got some follow up courses here on these, <laughs> these topics. So um, thank you very much. And uh, everyone else have a great day. Thank you, Rocky. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, this was amazing. Thanks so much. It was. Thank you.